focus and distraction. So these ideas go to the core of mag what magicians do. We focus your attention of what we want you to see and we distract it from what we like to remain hidden. In the magic world, we call this misdirection. Now here's a very simple demonstration of focus and distraction. The ball goes into the left hand and disappears. The eye always follows the movement and is naturally drawn to the ball. That's focus. The distraction lies with the other hand. It retains the ball hidden in the palm. At a glance, the hand appears empty and the eye has no reason to follow it. Focus on the left hand, distract it from the right. Finally, this piece of sleight of hand simulates exactly the genuine act of placing a ball in the hand. So when we fake, when the fake resembles the real, the deception is complete. Focus and distraction, two very simple principles at the heart of many magic tricks. But that's not all that magicians do, and it's not the only way we use the principles of focus and distraction. The magician isn't just interested in fooling the audience. The aim isn't to trick them. The aim is to create a magical, and if possible, an emotional experience. A suspension of disbelief, as Coleridge called it. I try to convey a semblance of truth in my writing to produce for these shadows of the imagination a willing suspension of disbelief that, for a moment, constitutes poetic faith. Now, this is the goal that all artists share, whether they are painters, poets, writers, singers, or museum directors. To create a magical experience, the first thing the magician does is set the level of the audience's expectations. In the days gone by, this began with the show posters. They teased all kinds of wonders, and by the time the audience arrived at the theater, they were ready for the magic. The use of advertising to focus attention is universal, but it is sometimes easy to forget how important it is. Our expectations set not only the level of, our, of interest, but how we react to the advertised event, whether it's a theater show, a movie, the latest Apple computer, or a placebo drug. The, uh, these advertisements focus our attention on the magical, even before the audience arrives at the show. They are convinced that magical things will happen. A performance venue also enhances the audience's focus and prevents distractions. Everyone sits quietly in their seats, facing the stage. You turn off your cell phone. The lights are lowered, an overture begins, a curtain rises, a spotlight hits the stage, and we are temporarily distracted from anything that might interfere with the enjoyment of the show. Again, we see this preamble to performance not only in theaters, but in other areas of life. It can be as simple as the cover and feel of a book, as colorful and noisy as the start of a football match, the thrilling entrance to a theme park ride, or the serene architecture of a museum. These pre-show elements set the tone and make the audience receptive to what follows. Now, I mentioned that the magician's goal is not just to fool the viewer. They don't talk about tricking their audience. In fact, instead of the word trick, we use the word effect. The effect is the memory we want the audience to retain after the performance is over. It is the experience of magic. I'd like to finish by showing you something that I think highlights the way we will focus on some elements and ignore others. Some years ago, I created a piece of software that enabled me to synchronize videos across multiple screens of iOS devices. Even though it's quite clear that technology is being used, I wanted the viewer to have a magical experience. So, let me show you. One of my favorite magicians was Carl Germain. He had this wonderful trick where a rose bush would bloom right in front of your eyes. 
But it was his production of a butterfly that was the most beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, the creation of life. When asked about deception, he said this. Magic is the only honest profession. A magician promises to deceive you, and he does. Now, I like to think of myself as an honest magician. I use a lot of tricks, which means that sometimes I have to lie to you. I feel bad about that. But people lie every day. Uh, hold on. Hey, where are you? I'm stuck in traffic. I'll be there soon. You've all done it. I'll be ready in just a minute, darling. It's just what I've always wanted. You were great! Except it's a fundamental part of life. Now, polls show that men tell twice as many lies as women. Assuming the women they ask told the truth. <laughs> we deceive to gain advantage and to hide our weaknesses. The Chinese general Shun Tzu said that all war was based on deception. Oscar Wilde said the same thing of romance. Some people deceive for money. Let's play a game. Three cards, three chances. One five will get you ten, ten will get you twenty. Now, where's the lady? Where is the queen? This one? Ah, sorry. Well, I didn't deceive you. <laughs> you deceived yourself. Self-deception. That's when we convince ourselves that a lie is a truth. Now, sometimes it's hard to tell the two apart. Compulsive gamblers are experts in self-deception. They believe they can win. They forget the times they lose. Our brain is very good at forgetting. Bad experiences are quickly forgotten. Bad experiences quickly disappear. Why, which is why in this vast and lonely cosmos, we are so wonderfully optimistic. Our self-deception becomes a positive illusion. Why movies are able to take us onto extraordinary adventures. Why we believe Romeo when he says he loves Juliet. And why single notes of music, when played together, become a sonata and conjure up meaning. That's Claire de Lune. Its composer Claude Debussy said that art was the greatest deception of all. Art is a deception that creates real emotion, a lie that creates a truth. And when you give yourself over to that deception, it becomes magic. Thank you.